the Latter-day Disciples welcome you to this final episode of the Putting on Christ Lecture Series by Brother Stephen Bishop. We hope that you have enjoyed this series, and if you haven't had the chance to already, we invite you to please go back and review episodes one through three of the lecture series before proceeding to this very sacred and special lecture. For those of you who have been attending this lecture series and enjoying it and gaining much spiritually, Brother Bishop has asked that I extend a special invitation to you to please write a review of the book Putting on Christ by Brother Bishop on Amazon. The reason for this is that once the book receives a certain number of written reviews, Amazon will begin to promote the book on its website. As Sister Bishop often says, it's not about sales, it's about souls. We invite you to find a quiet and safe place where you can ponder the message of these songs and Brother Bishop's experience. Our deepest desire is that we all may truly be born of God and experience unspeakable joy in the Holy Ghost and thereby become spiritually prepared to return to God's presence. We pray that you have received inspiration through this lecture series on how you may do so. And with that said, we invite you to enjoy part four of our lecture series, Putting on Christ. God, you're my God, and earnestly I seek you.
brutal inner honesty, kind of being a PI investigator of our own motives, like what makes us tick and why do we do the things we do and, you know, how we manipulate others and, you know, working through all those things. So I've never described my rebirth journey to anyone other than close personal friends and my family. Uh, so this is going to be the first time. So pray for me to make it true. I went on a mission, served in the Seville, Spain mission. And I served the Lord and gave it all that I had. I mean, every ounce I gave up during my mission. And I had quite a bit of success because of that. But it was really hard. I mean, the people were recalcitrant. They did not want to hear the gospel message for the most part. And so I was really all in on my mission. I came home taught at the MTC, taught several times at the MTC for a total combined of two years. I taught Spanish to missionaries at the MTC. And I knew the scriptures pretty well, you know, because I just studied them just like way intently and intensely on my mission. But I'd always tried, to, I'd, I always wondered what this whole baptism of fire was speaking to in the Book of Mormon and what that was, you know. And I remember thinking, well, you know, later after my mission thinking, you know, I haven't really received that baptism of fire and I'm not really seeing others who've had that experience. Anyway, so after my mission, I went through a little bit of an identity crisis because I'd been raised in the bubble of the church and gospel my whole life, and I really had not experienced the world. But after my mission, after this uh, little bit of this uh, identity crisis, I, I became completely immersed in the world. And I became the natural man, let's say, in all his glory. I was a man of the world, and I was full of or became full of guilt, shame, and sin. I was not keeping the commandments like I should have. But at the time, I got to a place where, because of the guilt and shame, I really didn't have a desire to grow close to God. And I ended up hardening my heart big time. So much so that I remember being in a state where I could not even fill my own soul. I don't know if anybody who is listening to my words have, has ever experienced that, but like I was so far gone or as far as a hardness uh, over my heart. Uh, I could not feel after God. I could not sense him. And the Lord, in his wisdom and in his knowledge, his foreknowledge, knew that he needed to help me to break free of that hardened heart. And so my in-laws uh, gifted me and my wife and members of our family uh, a training light seminar type of thing that was really about getting in touch with our inner child. And there were processes within that training that allowed us to really kind of break through and it really ended up being kind of a large baggage dumpage, like an emotional baggage dumpage of our issues, right? The issues that we carry, the traumas that we carry. It's, it was helpful in letting that go. And, and then I was introduced to another training seminar that did something similar, and I went deeper into it. And uh, through by the end of those two trainings, um, I really like became a new person in many ways, like I reconnected with, with me, the me that I couldn't feel, the divine me, right? And after that, after I'd gone through that, I could feel once again, then I had books that were 
you know, one particular book is on my bookshelf for a year. I hadn't opened it up because I wasn't ready to receive the spiritual knowledge that it contained. And I remember being led one day and having this overwhelming desire to go to a bookstore. And I'm, I'm really not a big reader, okay? I'm more of a reader today than I was then, but uh, I had this overwhelming desire to go to a bookstore. And I walk into this bookstore. It was, uh, what was it? Um, anyway, an LDS bookstore. Uh, maybe it's called Siegel Books, but anyway. I walk into this bookstore and I feel like energetically drawn to the self-help section. Obviously, I needed to help myself. And it wasn't a conscious thing at all, but I end up in the self-help section. And I'm like ener energetically drawn to one book in the bookstore. And in fact, it's the only book that I touched that day. And the book was called Your Sacred Self by Wayne Dyer. Now, at the time, because of my hardness of heart, I had a lot of issues with the church. In fact, I would tell people that I had a PhD with issues with the church. If I went into an LDS bookstore, I would actually start sometimes to get a little, a little nauseous. <laughs> so that... Um, you know, obviously I don't feel that today, but back then that's where I was at, right? Uh, full disclosure. But anyway, so God would not have drawn me to an LDS authored book. It would not have attracted, been attractive to me. I would not have really cared to read anything of that nature. But the Lord knew this and he led me to this book, Your Sacred Self. Again, it's the only book that I touched. I went right to it, pulled it pull it off the uh, bookshelf, open it up to the front, saw the table of contacts, and I'm like, yep, 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 yep. And like this book just sang to me. And I knew spiritually, energetically, that this book was specifically intended for me. And I read that book and I like loved it so much, I like gifted it to, wow, just lots of different people. I mean, I, I just passed it out to a lot of people. I think I bought like 50 bucks and handed them out to people. And then, of course, I enjoyed that so much that I wanted to read all of his other books. And I think I read about every book that Wayne Dyer had ever written. And that opened me up further to God because it was opening me to God, not religion. And so it really was what I needed at the time. I didn't need religion. What I needed was God. And when my heart opened through going through those trainings and having this baggage dumpish, dumpage uh, during those trainings, I felt in a way born again, even though I wasn't born again in that moment, but I felt free. I felt liberated. My heart softened. I was healing. My heart was healing. Preceding that time, uh, I went through a really hard breakup in a relationship that caused me to really harden my heart. So that's kind of what preceded the need for, for God to help me to break open that hardness around me. And anyway, so through this process, finding Wayne Dyer's book, Your Sacred Self, um, I read all those other books. My heart continued to open more and more and more. And then this intense desire to know God really surfaced like it was way intense. In fact, I remember in one of the training sessions that I described earlier, uh, there's a point where you dyad with your partner. And that's basically being about knee to knee, except sitting in separate chairs facing with each other. And one of the processes was... Um, you know, what is that they asked us to talk to our dyad partner was what is what is your greatest desire? Like the greatest thing. If you were a genie and you could you could have granted the greatest thing you'd ever desire, what would that be? And and uh my dyad partner started and he he uh began to express how he wanted 
the, the latest wave runner, you know, Sea-Doo that was available and how excited he would be to, to have that. That was like one of the greatest desires that he had. And having been opened by God through him having me put in play in, into this, these uh, seminars that helped me break open that hard shell around me and opening myself up to him. I remember telling my dyad partner that my greatest desire was to know Jesus Christ. And it was so sincere. And I just had tears rolling down my cheeks. I just wanted to know Jesus Christ. Now, fast forward into my married life. We now have maybe two or three children. That desire is still there very, very strong in me. And I was seeking to know God. And the way that I sought to know God was in meditation, to try to connect with God through my heart space. I tried to have my heart space receive information, spiritual information from his heart space. I tried to energetically or spiritually connect with God through meditation. And I continued this process every day, almost every day for about 10 years. Now I have a story in the book that's in chapter five that I won't get into because we've already gone pretty long, but I invite everybody to listen to that story. It's a story how I was led in one of my meditations that I did for about 18 months, I was led to meet Wayne Dyer through practicing his art, which I call faith. But that's another story for another day, or you can read the book. But uh, through this process, um, I had other experiences that once again caused me to grow within me a hardened heart. I had some major betrayals of people, two people that were clo very close to me. Now, the one, this, the more serious betrayal was over a lot of money that I had loaned this brother. And as a result of these betrayals, I lost, well, I became extremely angry. Like I would visualize grounding and pounding this individual. Like I uh, became kind of a rageaholic a little bit in the, from, to describe the level of my anger. I got to a point where I just sick of this anger carrying this anger, having this anger be a part of me. And I received uh, an endowment, uh, uh, some spiritual knowledge from the father that I won't get into. And it was probably about, um, uh, it was either weeks or months later, and it happened to be on Resurrection Sunday, which by the way, wow, this Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. And this month is 10 years from the from the month of my own rebirth. It's a, it's a rebirth day, right? As Megan Farner told me in a text, <laughs> happy rebirth day. But uh, I had this overwhelming desire on a Sunday morning to not go to church, right? Spirit works through feelings. And I had this feeling like, okay, you're not going to church today. You're going to go to your mother's grave and talk to your mom. Now, I'd never been to my mother's grave since her internment. So I was kind of excited to go for a first time. It had been years since she had been, since she had died and passed away. This was in 2004, June 6th, 2004. 
And when I got to, this was in Delta, Utah, when I got to Delta and I got to the, her grave site, it was, it was raining that day. And it was raining all around me. And I spent five hours at her grave. And I brought my scriptures with me as well and brought my patriarchal blessing. But most of the time I spent talking to my mom and also talking to God out loud. And even though it was raining that day, this little space where I was sitting did not get rained on. I had this little bubble over me, I guess, like there was not a drop of rain that hit me. I couldn't understand it, but it was awesome. Praise God. One of the desires that I had in going to my, my, uh, my mom's grave uh, on Resurrection Sunday was that I wanted a new life. I wanted brand new scenery. I had overwhelming desires through the spirit. Tell me, if you do not leave Utah, you're going to die. Now, looking back, what that meant was I was going to die spiritually. The Lord needed me to get out where I was at so that he could reach me. So two hours driving home, I spent... Uh, praying to God for the main thing that I needed, which was in order to move to Arizona, which was to have my house sell. But this was in the uh, downturn in 2008, 9, 10, you know, that whole area, uh, which was the kind of the great recession, right? That hit the world. And so there were no, there were no buyers really at this time. I mean, they didn't exist and certainly not cash buyers. And my house was worth a lot of money. And so like to have a cash buyer with that amount of money needed was really unheard of. I mean, it was unheard of having a sale that came through financing, right? At the time. So, but on my journey home um, and desiring this new life, uh, on Resurrection Sunday. I mean, it's, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. It is so beautiful looking back. But I prayed out loud that the Father would send me a cash buyer. And in fact, I said, I would affirm, I would, I would go between prayer and affirmations. So I'd pray to God, close the name of Jesus Christ, and then I would speak affirmations. And the affirmations were, one sentence, a cash buyer is on his way now. Now that was the faith of a little child. A cash buyer is on his way now. Not just any buyer, but a cash buyer, a lot of money. And then I would go to saying a prayer again. And I alternated between this affirmation and prayer for two hours, all of this spoken out loud. So fast forward two days, I'm in my office, which was in our carriage house. It was above a detached garage uh, on our property. And so I had a perfect vision to the front door area of our home. And a man approached our door, knocked on the door. And of course, you know, if I didn't hear from my wife soon, then I would have thought, okay, I need to go over there and make sure she's okay. <laughs> so it was great because I could be really vigilant in protecting my family because I was there. And people didn't know that I was there unless they were neighbors, perhaps. So this was a gentleman approached the door and he knocked on the door and he said, I'd like to buy your home. And I can close in like a couple of weeks. Or I'd like to close in a couple of weeks. And oh, by the way, I'm a cash buyer. There was no for sale sign 
on our yard. My wife calls me on the phone. She said, honey, you're never going to believe this. But this guy wants to buy our house. And he's a cash buyer. I dropped to my knees after hanging up with my wife and broke down expressing gratitude to God for hearing my plea. My wife knew that my desire was to move to Arizona. And none of the family really, well, none of the family at that time wanted to go to Arizona, but I knew that I had to go there through the voice of the spirit or else that I would die. And again, looking back, that meant die spiritually, not physically die. But I think I interpreted it back then as physically dying. But that's not what it was. So we ended up, you know, three weeks later, we were out of the house. We asked for another week. And uh, we still ended up having to move into... the home of one of our family members uh, for a little bit before we moved down to Arizona. Prior to moving, because of the betrayals that I had experienced from two people close to me, I had some major symptoms hit me and they were, the symptoms were pins and needles going through my whole body. And when I say my whole body, I mean my whole body. Nothing was sacred. Nothing was off limits. Pins and needles through my whole body. I remember talking to my father and basically saying goodbye. And then I remember going to the ER. And they ran all these tests and found nothing. They said, oh, you're perfectly healthy. But I knew that I was dying. Fast forward, uh, this the symptoms kind of diminished a little bit. We moved to Arizona, and in the first part of our experience in Arizona, I found myself two more times in the ER, wholly believing that I was dying. Now, the Lord works through his perfect numerology, right? He is a numbers person. He loves <laughs> working with some of these perfect numbers. You know, the number three is big to the Lord. You know, it's the number of the Trinity. It's the number of our first presidency. I mean, you can go on and on and on about the number three, but, but if you add them up, I was in the ER three times, wholly believing that I was dying. Now, most people, if they're smart, they will humble themselves, right? And repent of their sins, confess their sins, and come unto Christ. Uh, but not me. I needed a two by four in the back of my head. I needed to believe that I was dying to repent. And so through that belief, and after having experienced, experienced those three events in the, in the hospital, wholly believing that I was a dead man, I thought, okay, if I make it through this last one, this third one, I'm going to totally repent. I'm going to confess my sins. Now, at the time, I wasn't, um, you know, wasn't really a, I don't know, I would say not a huge church guy. I would say it was more about a, it was more about a person who wanted to know God and And uh, I just thought, okay, I'm dying, so I have to repent. And so I didn't go to my bishop at the time in our ward because I thought, okay, this is the natural man thinking process, okay? Uh, bishops get released. 
And then, you know, they may say something to their wife about my sins. And then the wife talks to someone in the religious society or the bishop says someone to somebody in elders quorum. And then long before you know it, my sins are before the whole Lord. <laughs> so that was my thinking, right? I didn't have a lot of confidence and trust in bishops. So I thought, okay, I'm going to set up an appointment with my state president, which I did. And you got to know my state president. I mean, he was about four foot 11. I'm being a little facetious here. He was taller than four foot 11, but he was a small man uh, as far as his stature is concerned. But spiritually speaking, he was a thousand feet tall. This man was a man of God. This man was in tune with the Lord and with his the Lord's voice and spirit. And I remember going in and confessing everything that I could think of, even if I'd confessed it several times during my lifetime before, I needed to be right with God. That's why I went in. And my hesitancy in wanting to repent was that I had sins that no one else was aware of, not even my wife. And I wasn't sure if any of my sins would have been guilty of or risen to the level of excommunication in fact i know that none of them would have risen to that level but i question if whether i could be disfellowshipped because i wasn't living a righteous lifestyle and so in the church, we know how this works. If you're disfellowshipped, then you know you can't hold a calling, you can't pray, I mean, you can't take the sacrament. I mean, you can't hide that, including our not being able to hide it from our wives. So then the thought process was, oh wow, well, if I'm disfellowshipped, then I'll have to come clean with everything. So this is again the thought process of the natural man. <laughs> And uh, and then the thinking, of course, you know, the devil gets involved and he's like, oh, well, you know, you could end up getting divorced next. And then if you get divorced, you could become ostracized from your children. Uh, you could lose your family. You're going to lose half of your net worth. All these thoughts penetrated my psyche, right? Again, the devil being right in there and uh, saying, you know, you don't need to do this. But because of the my, my belief that I was a dead man or soon to be a dead man and, and knowing that I wasn't right with God, then I made the decision and the commitment that I was definitely going to be right with God. Like, no matter what the cost, I was going to be right with God, no matter what. So I confessed all of my sins with my stake president and I spent probably, no, not probably, I spent 90 minutes with him. And like I said, even if I'd confessed a sin before, I mean, it didn't matter to me. I was going to be completely transparent and stand figuratively naked before God, which I did. After telling my stake president all of the truth of my then state of being and my then status before God, I asked him, would you consider giving me a blessing? I think it had been years since I'd asked anyone for a blessing. Matter of fact, I know it had been years. And he said, absolutely. And he proceeded to lay hands on my head and then proceeded to give me the most amazing blessing that I've ever heard of. In fact, I've never heard of a blessing like this ever. But like, I can't even speak about what he said because it's too, well, one, it's too unbelievable. And two, it's just too sacred. 
And when he was done with the blessing, I couldn't speak really. I just kept repeating the word in a whisper, wow. I kept saying, wow. And then I said to him, my state president, were you not here when I told you all of these horrific things of my past? Did you not hear what I said to you the last 90 minutes? And I just wept. I was broken. I was so broken during this period of time in my life that I could not open up a piece of mail. I could not pay a bill. This lasted for about five years. This is how broken I was. When the Lord says we have to offer a broken heart, I mean, I'll just say in my experience, that's a literal thing. But don't let this dissuade any of you from coming under Christ because on the other side of that brokenness comes exceedingly great joy, the knowledge of God, a redemption of Christ. I began to really believe that that salvation was available for me. But again, I would say this was still a, a level of strong belief, but it was supported by the Spirit of God, right? The light of Christ. And then fast forward a little bit longer, and I remember standing in, uh, in the doorway of the master bedroom, and this is when my belief in God became a perfect faith. My faith became profoundly awakened by God. I remember sensing and feeling this bestowal of this, let's call it energy or the spirit of God, come down on me. And through that endowment, I didn't believe anymore. I knew. I could see the kingdom of heaven and myself in it. Now, it's tough to describe, and actually you can't describe it, but but I received that perfect faith that I talked about earlier in the scriptures in 2 Nephi 9.23. It was a perfect faith. It was no, it was just like as if it had already happened, as if I had already received what had been promised, even though I had not already received that. And then it was probably, uh, I would say, within a couple months, uh, late April of 2013 which was, right, Easter, Easter month, right? Resurrection, coming alive in Christ. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. God is a genius. <laughs> he is amazing what he has done for me and for all of us who surrender to him and come unto him in full. I just want to impress upon people's minds and hearts that that the actual experience of spiritual rebirth is a real thing and that we really do come to the knowledge of God and we receive that witness in power by the Holy Ghost. And so I won't go more into that experience other than to say that I was baptized by fire, that the experience manifested itself again over successive nights. And in the evening, it was most pronounced. But I had been born by God and I had partaken of a oneness in Christ, I had experienced a portion of that, his consciousness, like I experienced a oneness in him. And I won't go further into that experience either, other than to say that I had that, I received that taste I've spoken of in the scriptures, right? So I will, I will just say that since then I've had other experiences uh, and other endowments. And I won't get into those other than to say that I bear sacred witness that the covenant path, not just 
making covenants, but keeping sacred covenants through faith and repentance, crying out to God, being willing to submit 100%, being willing to sacrifice all, can lead every single member of the LDS church to obtain the same knowledge of God. I bear witness that Jesus Christ lives, that he is the son of the living God, that he is our savior and our redeemer. And if we continue progressing along this path that leads to eternal life, he will become our very friend. These things are within the grasp of all Latter-day Saints. The only thing standing in the way is our own unbelief that these same promised blessings that are received by apostles and prophets can be received by the commoner, you and me, the seemingly insignificant Joe Blow or Jane Doe. It is our own unbelief. God is not a respecter of persons. If we fulfill the same law, we will receive the same blessing. Subject to fulfilling the laws that entitle us to those blessings. I am so grateful. And let me just say, for those of you who feel steeped in sin and guilt and shame as I was, I want you to know this. You are perhaps the closest to knowing God. Because when you look in the mirror, you don't see a righteous person, do you? You see someone who is needing of his grace because you will see yourself as a sinner, just as I saw myself as a sinner. And by seeing yourself that way, you will then see yourself in your own fallen and natural state, perhaps even less than the dust of the earth as described with King Benjamin's people. But through seeing yourself that way, you will receive the impetus to fall down and cry out and offer your all to God. Doesn't matter if you're a sinful man or a sinful woman. You can be changed in an instant by God. Even being in that unrighteous state, solely through your willingness to surrender all to him, and I mean all, and he can make you instantaneously righteous, through which is the righteousness of God, through our faith in him and our willingness to surrender our all. This is my witness. It is my undying witness. This is a witness that cannot be taken from me. I'm not an especial witness. Nevertheless, I am a witness of him. And I'm so grateful for that witness. And I know that, that, that he led me to the gate of salvation so that I could speak to these things from an, in, an experiential perspective, not from having read lots of, of books on spiritual rebirth. It was after the experiences that I received that I could then search the scriptures and search the words of apostles and prophets and find the pure gold that is out there, some of which I've read tonight and we've discussed tonight. Putting on Christ took me seven years to complete. Seven years. It wasn't because it really wasn't done. It was because I didn't want to button it up because I 
I didn't want there to be one other quote of gold that I wanted to incorporate in the book and have that be left out. That's the primary reason why that took so long. But I did my own research, my own, my own seeking and found these gems of pure gold. And I pray that these gems of pure gold, uh, that you might find them extremely fulfilling unto the salvation of your own souls. And I don't take, even though I received this conditional salvation, let's call it, I don't take anything for granted. I don't say I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm saved, so now I can just do whatever I want. No, it doesn't work that way. We have to endure to the end. And that enduring after the rebirth, there's a major battle that comes. Anyway, I am so grateful to everyone hearing these words. Uh, they're very sacred. Uh, I don't know that I'll ever talk about my own experience ever again in a form like this, but I want my kids to hear from their dad when he may no longer be here. I want them to hear, no. My testimony, my witness of the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how through abiding by its principles and precepts, we may come to salvation and knowledge of God. I'm grateful for Megan Farner and for the work that she does in promoting Jesus Christ in the world and his gospel. I'm grateful for apostles and prophets. I'm grateful for the restored truth and authority of Jesus Christ. Because without that authority and without those ordinances, there's no way I could have come to the knowledge of God as described and as witnessed to. There's no way. And so my heart breaks for those who are seeking to find the Lord knowing that without those ordinances, they can receive levels of grace, but they will never receive that level of grace until they come under heavenly contract with God through those ordinances by proper authority. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the true church of Jesus Christ on earth. It's not a perfect church, as I described earlier. It's filled with men who are like us, seeking the best that we can to do what's right and to find the knowledge of God ourselves. But it's perfect because it possesses perfect priesthood keys that allows us individually to come under Christ ourselves and be saved. And it really doesn't matter if everyone else chooses it to do different if we ourselves continue in the faith of Christ unto salvation. It wouldn't matter to me if the prophet himself apostatized from the church or any of the 12 apostles apostatized. It wouldn't matter or make any difference to me because I've obtained that knowledge. Nothing can deviate me from that knowledge. I want to share the, the love of Christ that's in my heart right now with all those that hear my voice. He lives. He's real. He loves us. And the Father loves us. And I have experienced that love on levels that I can't even describe or would even attempt to describe. But I'm just grateful to God for the grace that he gave unto me, a sinner. And through his love that I express and because of him, we can return to him and be with our families if we all make the same covering of obedience and surrender all to them. This is my witness in love, and I leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God, you're my God, and earnestly I seek you. My heart and my flesh, they hunger and thirst for you. 
Love this episode and the Latter-day Disciples mission? You can show your support by rating and reviewing, sharing this episode with a friend, checking out our volunteer opportunities on latterdaydisciples.com, and donating to our cause. 100% of donations are used just for the purpose of covering our operating expenses. We take no money in our own pockets. Your support is invaluable to us, no matter what form you choose to show it. Thank you for being our fellow disciples of Jesus Christ. There are great days ahead for those who love the Lord, and we can't wait to share them with you.